This is a joyful crowd. I like that. That's really, really good. That is good. First of all, let me say it is good to be with you tonight uh, in this role, which I don't get to. The only time that Pastor Nick's ever asked me to speak is whenever he goes out of town. And he says, I won't be available on my cell phone all week. So regardless of what I say tonight, you're not going to be able to get in touch with him and fuss until he gets back next week. But uh, uh, <laughs> uh, he, uh, yeah, that, I've aggravated him before whenever he asked me to speak. It's always whenever he's gone, so he won't have to hear it, I guess. But uh, I, I, let, me, let me throw this out. Uh, you know what I do for a day job, and I know that whenever I get done tonight, you're going to tell me to keep it, that <laughs> I don't need to be doing this all the time, and, uh, and I understand that, but, uh, <laughs> yeah. but uh, he asked me uh, whenever I come on as one of the elders if I would do this occasionally, and, and I, I agreed to, uh, to doing this, so... Uh, I'm going to start out, uh, as we start out a new sermon series uh, in the book of Daniel. So for the next 12 Wednesdays, there'll be somebody different up here every Wednesday night going into that next chapter. And I really like Daniel. It's the, the first six of the chapters is about him and his three friends and some of their adventures and the things that, uh, that they get into, and you see God just show up miraculously time and time again. And then the next six, uh, you better hold on to your seat because that book and Revelation really goes hand in hand, and it's so interesting, these last six chapters. So this is going to be a really good sermon series or teaching series, I'll say, if, uh, if I can start this thing out right tonight. You know, uh, in my line of work, we talk a lot, especially with our command staff, about a good foundation. So I know I've got to build that foundation tonight to get us on, uh, uh, on the word that uh, we want to be whenever we finish. Let me, let me say this to you right quick. In talking with uh, a, a lady, I had a, a meeting at hospital today, and so I, I'm getting off the elevator and going to this meeting this lady stops me and I don't know how she knew that I was going to speak tonight because she don't attend this church but she grabbed me on the elbow and she said hey she said I just want you to know you're going to have to do really really good to outdo your daughter so I, you know <laughs> hey I'm going to tell you but hey if she didn't really put pressure on me I said thank you so much no hey but uh, yeah that that's tough that's tough but uh Hey, but let me say this. My daughter is just like her mama, and, uh, and her mama loves the Lord more than she loves me. Y'all have heard me say that before, and it's true, and that's the reason she can put up with me. So, uh, hey, uh, and, and she's normally back there in the back in youth, and here she is sitting up here supporting me tonight. I appreciate that. You know, every, yes, hey, give her a hand. <laughs> hey. This week has been one of the hardest weeks I've had since I've become sheriff. This, in the last three days of my life, sheriff's business has really, really been tough. And every day, during the middle of the day, I have had to call her and ask her to stop what she is doing and to pray for me. So let, let me tell you, you know, to have a praying wife, to have somebody that I can just pick up the phone and dial seven digits and get for her to start praying for me immediately from one meeting to another or one attorney to uh, going to court or whatever the case may be. Hey, I praise the Lord for that because that is so special for me to have. Uh, just a, a prayer line direct to God just by picking up my phone. And uh, I'm just so thankful. So with me saying that, we're going to jump into Daniel. Let, let, me, let me set this, uh, the, the back story up. Obviously, Daniel wrote the book of Daniel, and he was taken captive in the first of three different invasions 
that the Babylonians came to Jerusalem and uh, and they they every time it got just a little bit worse and a little bit more violent until the third time they basically destroyed the temple and the entire city. The books of Isaiah and the books of Jeremiah talk in depth about the pending fall of Jerusalem and tells very, very specifically what's going to happen. And they keep being warned, but they didn't pay attention. And, and so uh, I, as, you, as we go through the book of Daniel, especially uh, as, as we move on out in the, from the middle on, I think that you're going to think at times that we're talking about things that are going on here in the United States right now. And as we go through this study, I, I think that you're going to agree with me on that. Daniel is about relationships, and we're going to talk about some of his special relationships that he started building uh, right in chapter 1 and went all the way through. And Daniel is a book about just how sovereign that our God is. The first six chapters, like I said, is about him and some of the adventures that he went through and some of the power that we see where God's hand had to be on him and on his friends. But I don't want us to forget that all these stories are true. They're about real people, and these events did occur. And that's very important for us to remember. So we're going to buzz through these, and I'm going to uh, read a a verse or two, and then I'm going to talk about it. So I'm going to start out with the first two verses. The ti- I, I titled this message, Remaining Faithful Regardless of Our Circumstances. And you'll see why as I, as I get on through this thing. During the third year of King Jehoiakim's reign in Judah, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to Jerusalem and besieged it. The Lord gave him victory over King Jehoiakim of Judah and permitted him to take some of the sacred objects from the temple of God. So Nehemiah took them back to the land of Babylonia and placed them in the treasure house of his God. In chapter 1, the king, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, he attacks and defeats King Jehoiakim. And then uh, the deportation of the people, although it was revealed in Isaiah and, and Jeremiah both, then over in Kings 2, in, in the second Kings, then the deportation of the people from Judah going to Babylon was also described. Uh, and like I said before, They attacked them three times, and on the third time, they basically destroyed the city uh, completely. And the Babylonians took many things back to Babylon with them as war treasure. Verse 3, then the king ordered Aspenaz, his chief of staff, to bring to the palace some of the young men of Judah's royal family, and other noble families who had been brought to Babylon as captives. Select only strong, healthy, and good-looking young men, he said. Make sure they are well-versed in every branch of learning, are gifted with knowledge and good judgment, and are suited to serve in the royal palace. Train these young men in the language and literature of Babylon. So, not only did he take sacred items out of the temple but now Nebuchadnezzar is taking the most talented the most intelligent and the best looking young men back to Babylon now in studying this story I began seeing this mind game that was being played out by King Nebuchadnezzar Nebuchadnezzar did I say that right y'all know what I'm saying okay uh, I, I should just say King N but Hey, all right, so what he's doing is he is actually taking the future of Judah as, because he didn't ask for any of these older folks like myself to go. He just asked for these young people. 
the brightest, the sharpest, the best looking. Hey, who would we all pick if we was going to build an empire? It would only be that kind of a description of the people that I would take with me, same way with him. So he starts playing a mind game with the Israelites. And it, it is such a mind game that it, I believe that it starts to affect these older folks back in, in uh, Judah simply because they know that they can't counterattack because all of their young people are already taken back to Babylon. Uh, he only wanted the well-educated, the nice-looking, and the socialized young men from the royal and noble families. And he only wanted the best because now they're going to represent him, the king. You know, Daniel was between 14 and 17 years old when he was taken captive and taken to Babylon. Can you put yourself into the sandals, so to speak, of these young men and their families? They are there at their homes, probably enjoying life like we do now, and all of a sudden there's a knock on the door or, uh, or, or the, the you hear the horses ride up, and the next thing that you know, they're actually taking your son, they're tying him up probably, and they are escorting him out of the house, putting him on uh, putting him on a trailer or maybe walking, whatever the case may be. But at any rate, you will never see your son again. You know, what, what, a, what a tough time that had to be for a 14 to 17-year-old and for their family. One minute these young men are, are just enjoying life in itself, and then the next minute they're going to be on their way between uh, 600 to 800 miles away, depending on uh, which, which, uh, which geographic uh, way that they went via this map. Upon arriving in Babylon, Daniel's going to be taught the Babylonian language, literature, and the culture, and he's also going to be made a eunuch. The idea, as far as the King Nebuchadnezzar was concerned, was to take everything that these young men knew and completely change it and to change their culture. Now, Something to note about these Jewish boys, captivity, they are actually even being elevated above being from the royal families and the nobles into actually living in the king's palace. So they're actually being elevated, although they're in captivity. They're not in chains and they're not in shackles once they get there. They have all the rights and all the privileges of living right there in the king's palace. Verse number five. The king assigned them a daily ration of food and wine from his own kitchens. They were to be trained for three years, and then they would enter the royal service. You know, what an honor in some respects of being chosen to be able to go to uh, leave Jerusalem and go to Babylon. You know, whenever you're 14 years old and everybody's either been 14 or you've had a 14-year-old, you know, sometimes whenever that somebody starts to show them some attention, what does that do? Hey, that, that, that is really good stuff. That's one of the things that we see whenever the, we work with some of these youths now that are involved in gangs and we start talking to them how in the world did you get involved in a gang? Well, it was just that somebody showed them attention. You know, hey, all it took was just somebody showing them a, a little affection, making them feel important, and now all of a sudden they're out here doing this crazy stuff that we and, and we have to go and deal with them. Well, you know, you can imagine how easy it would have been for Daniel and his friends to to uh, to kind of get on the bandwagon of all this royalty, and, and all of a sudden they're being shown all this attention. I can imagine that the food that they ate was probably completely above and beyond what the common people of that day ate as well. 
Verse number six, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were four of the young men chosen, all of the tribe of Judah. The chief of staff renamed them with these Babylonian names. Daniel was called Belteshazzar, Hananiah was called Shadrach, Mishael was called Meshach, and Ezra was called Abednego. Let's talk about that for just a minute. A name change. You know, Pastor Nick just got done with that sermon series on the names of God. And of course, all these names are around our, our sanctuary now. And I love coming in and sitting before service starts and just looking at all the different names that, that, that we call God. But our name identifies us very specifically and can have profound effects on our personality and on our confidence as well. In nearly 30 years of working on the highway patrol, I stopped thousands of people. And I would walk up to the window, and I guarantee this happened at least one time a day and sometimes more. Whenever that I would ask for their driver's license and registration, one of the comments was always, don't look at my picture and don't call me by my name. <laughs> and, I, I, and, of course, uh, early on I'd say, why not? Well, I don't like my name. My mama named me that. And my name is really, and they'd come up with some slang name that, that, that either they gave themselves or somebody else gave them. But they did not like their name. And I heard that all those years that I was on the highway patrol. So that really sank in at my house. Not really. I'll tell you this story really quickly. My wife's going to kill me. Whenever our son Chad was, was born, we, couldn't, we didn't know what we was going to name him, but we had decided on either Chad or Brad. God only knows literally where those two names came from. So my Emily was sitting on the hearth. She could just barely talk. And we said, Emily, which name do you like, Chad or Brad? She said, Chad. So that's how he got his first name. <laughs> well, how he got his middle name, I, back years ago, I was a NASCAR guy. And I was a Bill Elliott fan. Does anybody remember Bill Elliott? Yeah, okay. Uh, so I was a Bill Elliott guy. And I was a Bill Elliott guy to the extent that I named my youngin Elliott as his middle name. You know? <laughs> I don't know what in the world I was thinking. But anyway, hey, that's how it's Chad Elliott, Christopher. So uh, bless his heart. He's scarred forever. Uh, <laughs> But that's how he got his name. So he's probably one of those guys that says, do not call me by my name. <laughs> you know, uh, but that, that's what happens. And, you know, seriously, parents need to really consider what they're going to name their child. I, I would have done something a whole lot different had I been thinking whenever that, uh, all that happened. I can assure you. Let, let, me, let, let me go back just for a minute and talk about what Daniel means. Daniel's name means God is my judge. Hananiah means beloved of the Lord. Michelle means who is as God. And Azariah means the Lord is my help. Well, Nebuchadnezzar knew he had to get rid of of that kind of prophecy. Uh, you know, hey, he can't, he can't have people in his kingdom that has names like that. So as part of the culture, he does the name change. And so he changed Daniel's name to Belteshazzar, which means Baal's prince. Baal was the name of the Babylonian god who Nebuchadnezzar worshipped. Hananiah, they gave the name of Shadrach, and that name means illuminated by the sun god. Mishael, his name was changed to Meshach, and his name means who is like Venus. And then Azariah was changed to Abednego, which means the servant of Nego, 
who was another false god. So this was just another way of changing a person, both by identity and psychologically. What was the purpose of the food that they were offered, the name change, and the three years of indoctrination, or, or three years of education that they were going to get? It was just to totally indoctrinate these guys to change their mind to where that they had forgotten everything that they had been taught back in Jerusalem. Is basically brainwashing. Nebuchadnezzar wanted them to forget their past, set their mind to the things of the Babylonian Empire, and he wanted these trainees to feel like they were totally dependent upon the Babylonians. You know, I encourage you, don't let the world change your name, your identity, or your character. You know, sometimes, although our outside world may change, we need to think and be like Daniel and not allow things to change us. You know, we live in a culture today much like this Babylonian culture was then. Our culture today is very much anti-God. I deal with it every day. You know, we, we have the largest jail ministry in the state of North Carolina. We've trained over 600 people to go into our county jail and to tell people about Jesus. But I can assure you, there's people that don't like that, and I have to deal with that every day, nearly. We are constantly being bombarded and pressured into the world's view of things. Y'all agree with that? You know, hey, look at the commercials that we have to watch, night in and night out. If, if you're crazy enough to turn that TV on, man, you're going to get your head filled with stuff that it really don't need to be filled with, because... All it does is twist your thinking. It, you know, look, look at the appearance of the people that are in these commercials most of the time. You know, I, we can't live up to that as just normal human beings. There's no way. I can't run enough miles. I can't lift enough weights. I can't eat enough chicken and rice I, I, to, to look like some of these people look. But they are doing everything they can to get me to look that way. They, are, they want me to buy everything that you can possibly think of and brainwash me into believing that that's what's going to happen to me. So it, it's, it's no different today than it was then. Actually, it's probably worse today. All right. Let's go to verse number 8. This is the verse that I want to, to, to really, uh, I want you to grab a hold of. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. What does it mean to purpose something in my heart? If I purpose something in my heart, that means that I've already got my mind made up, and more than likely I've, mind, I, I've made up my mind a long time ago that I'm going to stand on whatever that my mind is made up on and that I'm not going to be sold out. I'm done, I'm locked in, and there's nothing that's going to change my mind. And that is exactly what happened to Daniel. I feel, I feel that Daniel was thinking, they may change my name, they may change the language that I speak, they may change the country that I live in, but nothing is going to change my heart. So he purposed in his heart. He knew he needed to be faithful in something as small as what he was eating. So speaking of eating and food, and I know that nobody, at least around my house, likes to talk about that. We like it, but we don't like to talk about it because it does stuff here to us that, we, that, that makes us get out here and pay for all that stuff I was just talking about a minute ago. This is a little nugget for you. The root of all sin goes back to the eating of the forbidden food in the Garden of Eden. I won't talk no more about food, but I'll just say, think about that. In talking about being indoctrinated, let me just stop and give you a little lesson on the Christopher indoctrination if you come and join our family. 
We're FOCD in the Christopher residence. Does anybody besides my wife and Emily know what I'm talking about? That sounds like a disease, don't it? Well, and, it and it probably is for a lot of people. But FOCD, to me, my wife, and my children, stands for faithfulness, obedience, commitment, and determination. These four words, if applied to your life, will sustain your Christian walk. Those four words, if you'll focus on those four words, you will be identified as a Christ follower wherever that you go if you have these four characteristics living on the inside of you and you're demonstrating them on the outside. You will find that you are more than a conqueror through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ when you adopt and apply these four character traits daily. Faithfulness, obedience, commitment, and determination to serve our Lord and Christ Jesus. Why did Daniel object to the king's food? Really? What was the problem with just eating a little bit of this good food that was prepared for the king day in and day out? It was in a, it was in a direct uh, disobedience to God's word. Although wine at that time was not forbidden, but in that culture during that time, food and wine was dedicated to the gods. So Daniel did not want to eat and drink from the king's table. Also, how long was that training going to have to be? It was three years. That's right. That's a long time to eat fruits and vegetables. I'm sorry, to eat vegetables and water, isn't it? But Daniel purposed in his heart to do the right thing. Again, he was portraying faithfulness, obedience, commitment, and determination to do what was right. He demonstrated a great deal of faith to trust God because he knew that God was going to work this out for him and for his friends. Now, God had given the chief of staff both respect and affection for Daniel. So what were the results because of the way that Daniel handled himself? He had God's favor and God's blessing, even the chief officials. Daniel was respectful and polite, and what a great lesson for us because we represent the Lord every day. Whenever you walk out of your house and you go to the restaurant in the morning for a cup of coffee or whether you go to work or whatever that you do in, in, a, in, in your day, you're representing Jesus Christ every step of the way. I can assure you of that. And people are watching you. All you have to say is, I'm a Christian. And man, whenever that you do, hey, you're going to be living in that glass house just like law enforcement officers live because people are going to watch everything that you do. That accountability level goes sky high as soon as you identify yourself as either being a Christian or a Christ follower, or if you invite them to come to church with you the next Sunday. Same way, it's going to go up. God changed that official's heart, and God will do the same for us if we follow this FOCD principle and we serve him above and above beyond all else God honors those that honor him but he responded I am afraid of my lord the king who has ordered that you eat this food and wine if you become pale and thin compared to the other youths your age I am afraid the king will have me beheaded Daniel spoke with the attendant who had been appointed by the chief of staff to look after Daniel and an I Michelle and Azariah, please test us for 10 days on a diet of vegetables and water, Daniel said. At the end of the 10 days, see how we look compared to the other young men who are eating the king's food. Then make your decision in light of what you see. You know, this official had to be scared to death to, to get on board with this plan because he knew how mean and how unreasonable that King Nebuchadnezzar was. Daniel had enough faith in his God, though, that he knew that he was not going to get that official in trouble. In attempting to convince the official, Daniel chose a very reasonable amount of time for a test. 
I think, you know, that was just God's way of speaking to him. And, and he knew that if he said 10 days, you know, of course, most of us, 10 days, that's not too long. And I think if he had said, hey, try us 30 days, try us 45 days, hey, there's a good possibility this guy would have said, there's no way because, hey, I like my head better than, I, than, than, than I'm going to, uh, to, to worry about whether and what you eat. Uh, but 10 days, hey, that, that was just a very reasonable amount of time. That's just another sign that God's hand was on this whole situation. Can you see the wisdom that God was giving Daniel as he was working his way through this, this whole situation? Look at the wisdom that Daniel used in negotiating this arrangement. He sold it as it being just an experiment. And he was polite, he was kind, and he was reasonable. And even offered another solution to keep the official out of trouble if he was uncomfortable with the 10 days. You know, what did he say? He said, hey, after 10 days, if we look pale and we look bad, hey, we'll just go to start and eat the king's food. You know, he had this thing worked out because God had given him wisdom. God's hand was on him and God's favor was on him. They ate vegetables and they drank water. And they did this for the entire three years that they were in training. The attendant agreed to Daniel's suggestion and tested them for 10 days. At the end of the 10 days, Daniel and his three friends looked healthier and better nourished than the young man who had been eating the food assigned by the king. So after that, the attendant fed them only vegetables instead of the food and wine provided for the others. So what was the results after the official uh, consented to the 10 days? These guys looked that much better. Can you imagine after 10 days, you know, hey, that just, that just tells me again, God's hand and God's favor is on these guys. This is God's hand at work, just like he is in some of our lives or all of our lives every day. The Babylonian official had all the power. He could have said no at any time. These four boys were completely at the official's mercy. But God's hand was on this man, and God's favor was on the four Hebrew boys. Because God's hand was on this official, he allowed this experiment to occur. After seeing the results, they'd done it for three years. God gave these young men, these four young men, an unusual aptitude for understanding every aspect of literature and wisdom. And God gave Daniel the special ability to interpret the meanings of visions and dreams. When the training period ordered by the king was completed, the chief of staff brought all the young men to King Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and no one impressed him as much as Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, so they entered the royal service. Whenever the king consulted them, consulted them in any matter, requiring wisdom and balanced judgment, he found them ten times more capable than any of the magicians and enchanters in his entire kingdom. Daniel remained in the royal service until the first year of the reign of King Cyrus. God gave these four Hebrew boys knowledge and skill. This intellectual ability that Daniel and these other three young men had was not because of their diet. It was because of a special intervention that God put his hand on them. These, these young men had more knowledge, more skill in literature. They had more wisdom. And Daniel had a special, uh, a, a special uh, anointing on him to talk about and to interpret visions and dreams. And we're going to learn about that in the next uh, three or four weeks. The king interviewed all these guys and found that none of them was like Daniel and the three uh, Hebrew boys. They were chosen to serve the king, and they were deemed to be ten times better. Ten times is a lot. You know, hey, how, how much better is ten times? I can't imagine if they were all being trained alike being ten times better. But that just tells you what God's favor will do for you in your life. 
Because these young men's faithfulness, obedience, commitment, and determination to serve the Lord, they were shown great favor, just like we will be. God blessed them mightily. You know, sometimes our trials will draw us closer to God. Daniel and his three friends honored God, and in turn, God honored them. Although these young men were immersed in the study of someone else's culture, someone else's literature and religion, they remained faithful to God. These young men may have been in Babylon, but they were not of Babylon. And we better be thinking that same way. We may be in this world, but we don't have to be of this world. You have heard me say this before from the pulpit about a year and a half ago or so whenever I was here. I talked just a few minutes about having that sticker on my computer. And uh, if you come into my office in the morning, there's a sticker at the top of my computer, and it says, compromise leads to captivity. Let me say that again. Compromise leads to captivity. We, we all probably need to say that a time or two a day, especially whenever we start to be faced with something that's just a little bit just a little bit of one of those things where you have to stop and think just a minute. Compromise will always lead to something going on in our life that we really didn't want to get into. And it may start out being something so small. And the next thing you know, you're into something and it is up around your neck and you can't even breathe. You know, one one of the things that that I have uh, that I have done my best to do, and that is never be alone with a with another woman at my office. Um, I have a a, a a public information officer, and uh, we have to go to all different kind of places together. But I never take her with me alone. I just decided a long time ago it's just better for me not to ever do that. So either we drive separate vehicles, and you'll see us going down the road like this. It probably looks crazy to most people because somebody's going to say, why in the world don't you just let her ride with you? But if I don't have another person riding with me that day, then we take two vehicles, and that's just the way it needs to be. I just don't want to ever put myself into a position. I don't want to put her into that position but it's just a good way for me to handle my business. And so that's, that's something that I do. And so whenever I see that sticker, all these times, day in and day out, just like on a computer, how much craziness can we get into on a computer in about 30 seconds? All it takes is one wrong click and something pop up there, and you look at it for just a second and say, I think I'll click on this, and that's all it takes. And man, there you are. And you may be in a situation that you are going to be scrounging to try to get out of for years to come. Just remember, compromise leads to captivity for us. These four young Hebrew boys did not compromise, nor did they compromise when they were faced in a couple chapters from now at the fiery furnace. What were they going to do? I'm not going to preach that sermon, but let me tell you. Hey, that's one of the best stories that I know of that I tell over and over and over again. And that is, hey, listen, it was just fine if they had to go in that fire. And uh, I, that's, I think Chip's preaching that one, so I'm going to hush. But well, let me tell you, that, that is a great encouragement. Nor whenever Daniel was faced with being thrown into the lion's den, he could have just given it up. He, all he had to do was just quit praying, you know, and, and he didn't have to face getting thrown in the lion's den but you know what he said i'm not going to compromise my belief and you see what happened the next time you're faced with a difficult situation involving compromise i encourage you to remember this first chapter of daniel this this first chapter really is a great foundation for your life period and i and something I want you to think about, I heard Stephen Furtick say this the other morning. I get on the treadmill every morning. Uh, I know you can't tell, 
but hey, hey, it, I do. I really do. Don't assure you. And, and so uh, <laughs> I, I, I had to get her to make sure that y'all, I mean, that we verify that. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, and, I, and so I listened to Stephen Furtick or somebody like him every morning. That's where I really get a lot of good stuff. But he said, your greatest testimony will come from your greatest test. And we all know what keeps us going sometimes. It's our testimony. And these guys had a testimony now. I mean, man, they, they, they were already sold out. But after what God did for them right here, they had a testimony for life. And the victories that we have watched God provide and the faithfulness that we have all saw him in our everyday life. You know, I want us to use our testimonies as an example of what God has done for us. You know, it, whenever that you're out talking with people, whenever that you're out uh, having any kind of conversation, I encourage you, talk about Jesus Christ. Ha have a conversation with people about your faith. You know, you don't have to take that Bible and beat them over the head. Uh, but, I, but I tell you, Hey, if, if, if you will just gently start to tell people what God has done for you, and, and listen, hey, it can really get some great information going uh, both ways, back and forth. Whenever I go back and uh, get to talk with the inmates, hey, I've learned a long time ago, you really can't force feed those guys. Th those guys are not the type of guys, most of them, that you can force feed. You've got to go back there, and you've got to be an example to them. You have to treat them with dignity and respect. You have to show them just the same respect as I would show one of you out here in the lobby. And whenever that I do that, they start to trust me. And then whenever that I have the opportunity to sit down with them, man, I can share some really good stuff with them. And it's not even in what they're thinking to be a biblical context. Next thing you know, I've got my hands out here, their hands are in my hands, and I'm praying for them. Hey, you know, that's what it's all about. And that's our job. You know, that's our job as Christians. That, that, that is what we're supposed to be doing. I'm going to finish up by telling you this little story. Uh, there was a Spanish... Uh, guy and he was a uh, explorer and his name was uh, Hernan Cortez some of you uh, history buffs may uh, may know that name or I've got a history teacher in here and he was one of those guys that was in a race with Christopher Columbus and some of these other guys to get over from Spain and England to the new world and it was very important to him and he he wanted to be one of these guys that got to this new, uh, new world, to North America, and to uh, be able to say that he conquered something. And so he, uh, he gets this expedition ready. There's three ships of them. They pull out from a harbor, and they take off, and they sail across. And after all these months at sea, they finally shipwreck. Well... Where in the world would they shipwreck at? But in Mexico, right in the middle of Mexico. Well, can you imagine in the late 1500s what Mexico would look like then if it's as hot as it is down there now? And I'm sure it probably was. I'm sure they shipwrecked and said, oh, man, what a place. But at any rate, they were there. So he gets everybody off the three ships, and they unload the three ships, and they set them up a little fort, and... Next thing you know, they've got a little settlement established. And one night, they all go to bed, and they go to sleep. And Cortez slips down to the boats or down to the ships, and he starts a fire. And he burns all three of these ships up. Well, these guys that I'm sure is with him, and I'm not so sure that they're all as sold out as he was about being in Mexico, in the 1500s, they all start to wake up, I guess, smelling smoke and seeing the fire. And they all run down to the, to the shoreline and, say, and they say, what in the world happened? What is going on? 
And then they see him there with the torch in his hand. And there's their ships going down into the water. And they said, what in the world are you thinking? I'm sure they probably said something a whole lot worse than that. But at any rate, their only ride back home, there it went. So they said, what in the world are you thinking? And he said, I'm either going to conquer this new world or I'm going to die trying. So what I want to challenge you with this afternoon is I want you to die trying to take everybody that you can to heaven with you. You know, that, that is my challenge to you tonight. I want you to find somebody else to go with you. You know, we, we, Chip and I and some more of the Band of Brothers was at a uh, prayer meeting last night in the courthouse in the big historic courtroom with those Ten Commandments sitting there. And we just had a, we had a, we had a great time for just a little while, and we're going to do it again next month, uh, and we'll, we'll put it out and let you all know because, hey, and it's for men because it's time for men to step up and start being what a man's supposed to be. I don't have time to preach that tonight, but at any rate, um, uh, but as I was, as I was there uh, being challenged by one of the pastors there last night, he said, whenever you come back next month, he said, I want you to bring two people with you, but I don't want it to be people that you go to church with. I want it to be somebody else other than guys that you go to church with. So, hey, we're going to do our best to fill that courtroom. And I said that to you to say, I challenge you, Sunday morning, bring somebody else with you. You know, we're blessed here at New Covenant to have some of the greatest preachers and teachers in, in North Carolina, probably in the southeast, if the truth be known. And Pastor Nick, he's spot on week after week after week. And if he's not here, with the exception of myself, hey, we got some great guys that get up here and t tell you some good stuff, uh, guys and girls. But I challenge you, bring somebody with you. This world needs you. Our state needs you, and this county needs you. I heard us. I, let, let me let me say this. Uh, in in talking with the CEO at the hospital today, he said that whenever he got here, back about uh, 19, 20 months ago, that the uh, the percentage of women who had babies at our hospital, right across the road here, that. 50% was born addicted. Is that not nuts? Folks, we can't have that. We can't have that. They have turned that tide just a little bit, but we cannot have that. We have got to do a whole lot better job in a lot of areas. And you know what? The only people, or the only way it's going to ever get done is the faith community. We can't depend on the government. You just cannot. You can't depend on the courts. You can't depend on the law enforcement to arrest everybody that needs to be arrested. Because I can tell you, hey, our, our, our drug arrest since I become sheriff is up 192%. 192%. Is that not nuts? 192%. But, you know, hey, and I've got some great employees. Let me tell you, those guys and girls, they work so hard. They have done a fantastic job. But, you know, it's, it's like stepping on ants. Man, you step on, it, you step on them over here and, and, you know, they just kind of multiply. You know, it is really, really hard for us. So, hey, and, but the only way we're ever going to fix our problems is if we if we get a hold of God the way we're supposed to, and if we come and before the throne, if we bring people with us before the throne, and if we do what we're supposed to do, remember to be faithful, obedient, committed, and determined to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Let, me, let, let us bow our heads. Our Father, Lord, as we come before you this afternoon, Lord, I thank you for this time that we have had to just learn more about you. 
just to reiterate the fact of how much that you love us, how good you are, how sovereign you are, how powerful that you was so many thousand years ago. And Lord, you're just that powerful today. There is nothing that you can't do. There, Lord, you, you're needed more today than, than probably ever before. Father, we ask that you will give us that, our desire to, to, uh, to do our job that you've given us to do. That, Lord, that we will, we will either conquer this or we're going to die trying. You know, Lord, we can all rest when we're dead. But until that time, we need to be out here working for you and serving you and doing the things that you have told us that we need to be doing. Father, the challenge is before us. And I just ask, Lord, that you will give us the energy, give us the strength, give us the wisdom, and give us the courage, the boldness to do what we know that we're supposed to do for you. For all this I pray in Jesus' name, amen. All righty.